Uh, hello, welcome to this lecture, Introduction to Psychedelic Studies and Psychedelic Phenomenology, from Huxley's Doors to Sosjet Hughes Luminotics. Uh, this lecture was created for my Sac State students, uh, taking Phil 117, Existentialism. And although it's an on-ground class, this being a new unit to the course, I thought I'd create a recorded version as well. The lecture will have three parts. First, a general introduction to psychedelic studies. Then a close reading of the first half of Huxley's Doors of Perception, arguably the first more or less complete philosophy of psychedelia. And then we'll look to some recent work done in the field of psychedelic phenomenology. So let's get going with the question. For the beginners, what are psychedelics? Uh, psychedelic drugs are a subcategory of mind-altering chemical agents. The recent neuroscience suggests that they act as agonists, stimulating the serotonin receptors in the brain. They also seem to work on more or less all the systems of the brain, depending on which ones you look at, but this isn't going to be a lecture on neuroscience. What gets included or excluded in the category psychedelics is up for debate, but the so-called classical psychedelics include mescaline, synthesized and occurring in the peyote cactus, LSD, synthesized by Albert Hoffman, but existing in analogs in ergot fungus, as LSA, or morning glory seeds. DMT, occurring in many roots and trees, especially of the acacia species, and the active ingredient in ayahuasca, and a related compound often thought to be the most intense, though less visual, and purest of classical psychedelics, 5-MeO-DMT, found in the secreted mucus of Sonoran desert toads. The common effect of these psychedelics is fantastica, producing visions or hallucinations, often mystical experiences, as well as occasional bad trips. Dale Pendel's Pharmaco Trilogy is one of the most distinguished works in psychedelic studies, and you can see his breakdown of the different, often overlapping effects on the top right here. We'll be focusing mostly in his fantastica category, but you can see that there's some significant overlap with Amanita muscaria, cannabis, MDMA, salvia divinorum, etc. We'll look at some other psychoactive substances because of their importance to the history of psychedelia as well. Ketamine and nitrous oxide, or laughing gas, the stuff your dentist gives you, are generally not considered psychedelics, but there is a documented history of psychedelic experiences on these substances, as well as ongoing debate about whether the phenethylamines, such as MDMA and MDA, as well as many others, should be classified as psychedelics or not. The term psychedelic was coined in 1956 in a letter exchange between British author Aldous Huxley and the Canadian psychiatrist Humphrey Osmond, and was meant to be a replacement to the then widely used term in medical psychiatry, psychotomimetic, i.e. mimicking psychosis. The idea at that time was that psychomimetic compounds mimic schizophrenia and could be used by doctors to better understand states of madness. Psychedelic literally means psyche opening or mind or soul manifesting. Another term considered at the time, which we'll look at later, was phanerothyme, revealing the visible, the thumos or spirit. A later term coined by Carl A.P. Rook and quite often used is entheogen, meaning a birthing of the divine or the gods from out of a moment of divine mortal interaction or ontogenesis. In naturally occurring forms, the use of what are now called psychedelics and many other mind-altering compounds, especially cannabis and alcohol, is as old as human history itself. Anthropologists have discovered snuff and smoke mixtures, including cannabis in Paleolithic caves. Paleontologists debate whether prehistoric paintings of human-animal hybrid figures, theriomorphs such as the shaman at Trois Frères, are in part inspired by mind-altering substances. The study of Neolithic iconography in the Old and the New Worlds have revealed possible images of psychoactive plants and fungi. Some Neolithic pottery used for fermenting alcohol has also been demonstrated to have traces of psychoactive ingredients in beer, wine, or meat production. That the Greeks and Romans used psychedelic substances, especially in the initiation ceremonies of their mysteries, is by now fairly well established. Mythologically, Odysseus visits the witch Circe and immures himself to her mind-altering potion, which turns his men to swine, when the god Hermes points out the molly plant, possibly datura, that he must eat to avoid being vulnerable to her potion. 
the goddess Demeter institutes her mysteries, and the Kikian potion, ostensibly a mixture of grain, mint, and pennyroyal, was likely also spiked with LSA containing ergot, possibly also opium and magic mushrooms. I think it probably had all three. Ancient oinology, the study of wine, not only in ancient Greece and Rome, but going back through the Neolithic and across continents, has concluded that wine or beer was often a tincture, spiked by more or less anything and everything that might enhance its mind-altering properties. The Vedic god Indra and his poet priests or rishis had their soma or drink of the gods. The Mayans worshipped not only the corn, but also the god of the mushroom and their art often suggests what kind of mushroom. The Peruvian use of ayahuasca, or North American use of peyote, is said by its practitioners to go back thousands of years. The African continent uses iboga, the active ingredient ibogaine, the Egyptians blue lotus or the acacia smoke, likely DMT, and the burning bush of Moses, say some recent researchers in Israel, may refer to ritual use of plant smoke containing DMT. The Polynesians have their Kava Kava ceremony, Chinese civilization, its opium, kratom, etc. As Nietzsche pointed out, on the basis of much less evidence than we have today, quote, Oh, who will tell us the entire history of narcotics? It is nearly the history of culture, our so-called higher culture. So we know that for all of recorded history, humans have used psychoactive substances. But what for? The bulk of the evidence shows that their use is primarily for the sake of religious or mystical experiences, initiatory ordeals and transitions, ritual contact with spirits, nature, supernature, and the gods. Of course, there are big problems when we attempt to translate any of these English terms for different peoples into different languages. Nevertheless, we can generalize that psychedelics are a major feature of most all human culture. The exploration of states of intoxication and extraordinary altered states is a basic feature of human existence, which is why we're covering it in a course with the title Existentialism. In late antiquity, their use seems to have gone largely underground, not without some exceptions, in the subsequent history of the three great monotheisms, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. However, initially, some Christian communities may have practiced shared meals, communion, the Eucharist, festively and with mind-altering substances. For sure alcohol, but researchers speculate mushrooms and much else besides. Before long, official Islam banned intoxicating substances, but this did not stop Sufi explorers from discovering what the fuss was all about. Western alchemists and esotericists reading ancient ethnobotany treatises preserved some knowledge of soul-altering chemical agents, and some medieval villages under Christendom took LSA inadvertently when they ate ergot-infected bread, resulting in what came to be known as St. Vetus's Madness or St. Anthony's Fire. Wide fascination with mind-altering substances returned to Western civilization in the 19th century, at first almost exclusively among the intelligentsia. With the rise of modern pharmacology, the synthesis of nitrous oxide and other mind-altering chemicals, and the widespread use of opium. Thomas de Quincey, a platonic and conscient Schillingian philosopher, is remembered most for his Confessions of an Opium Eater of 1821. Humphrey Davy, a celebrated inventor and chemical philosopher, thought high-dose intake of nitrous oxide revealed the truth of idealism that matter is only a projection of the mind. Arthur Schopenhauer wondered whether intoxicants can be used for creative purposes in moderate doses, and also whether they could submerge individual consciousness, representation, phenomena, into the world of the will in itself, the thing in itself, or noumena. A generation or two later, Nietzsche tried the experiment. His first book, The Birth of Tragedy, put the narcotic brew of Dionysian mystery religion back on the scholarly agenda of modern philology and philosophy. The great American pragmatist and mystical philosopher William James, however, did the most to stimulate scientific, humanistic, and philosophical interest in altered states of consciousness with his 1909 The Varieties of Religious Experience. James experimented with nitrous oxide, which in part resulted in his embracing of the panpsychism of Gustav Fechner, and he famously revised his critique of Hegel's philosophy, claiming that only under the influence of nitrous oxide 
did he finally understand the truth of Hegelism, enthusiastically recommending that posterity repeat his experiment. William James was influential on French philosopher Henri Bergson, in turn influential on British Hegelian philosopher C.D. Broad, who was in turn influential on Aldous Huxley in The Doors of Perception, which we'll get to soon. A little earlier, the French symbolist poet Charles Baudelaire published his 1860 book, Artificial Paradises. The German-Jewish author Walter Benjamin followed up with his hashish experiments and posthumously published a book on hashish. The French theater guru and opium addict Antonin Artaud was the first Westerner to take peyote in a traditional setting among the Tarahumaras in Mexico and write about it in his voyage to the Tarahumaras, often titled The Peyote Dance. The violence-glorifying German author Ernest Jünger, a later friend of Albert Hoffman, experimented widely with psychoactive compounds leading to his Approaches, Drugs and Intoxication of 1970. Mescaline was the first to be synthesized in 1919, and LSD in 1938. By the 1950s, everybody wanted to try it. The two greatest books on the mescaline experience from this period are French poet Henri Michaud's Miserable Miracle and Aldous Huxley's Doors. By this point, the cat was out of the bag. Among existentialism-inflected thinkers, Octavio Paz, Herbert Marcuse, Jean-Paul Sartre, Michel Foucault, Gilles Deleuze, Felix Guattari, and R.D. Lang, and many others all experimented with psychoactive compounds and wrote about their experiences. Carl Jung deeply disapproved. It was from American experimental psychology that psychedelics were given their greatest boost into the popular culture of the 1960s, before too long leading to their prohibition in modern nation states, even for medical uses. Most famously, Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert, tenured professors of psychology at Harvard, began promoting their wider use and engaged in increasingly unscientific experiments with a growing following. They were dismissed from the university, and many blame Leary for prohibition. This is probably too harsh. Meanwhile, Ken Kesey's participation in the CIA-funded Stanford experiments, more on those soon, led to his traveling magic school bus days with the Merry Pranksters, and before long, the LSD and free love revolutions were born. Wolf's The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test first tells this story. The legendary tale of what went down and who the major players were and what happened next has been told many times since. Formerly in Jay Stevens' 1998 Storming Heaven, LSD and the American Dream, and most recently in Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind, what the new science of psychedelics teaches us about consciousness, dying, addiction, depression, and transcendence. Poland's book proved to be a media sensation, putting the psychedelic renaissance back onto the map of popular culture. It tells the interesting story of the FDA's gradual slackening of the Reagan-era war on drugs policy, first with Straussman's 1990 DMT research at the University of New Mexico, and snowballing into the amazing recent success of MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies. Founded in 1986, but at its apex today, which recently gained FDA approval for clinical trials to use MDMA to treat PTSD and psilocybin for use in end-of-life therapy. In the past 10 years, psychedelics have very much mainstreamed, with some states decriminalizing not only cannabis, but also magic mushrooms. Alternative psychedelic therapies are becoming big business. It might even be that there are more conferences today on psychedelic entrepreneurialism than psychedelic experience. Many of you may have been the victim of Facebook ad campaigns to dubiously credentialed online medical clinics advertising online diagnosis and ketamine therapy for depression or Adderall, i.e. meth salts, for ADHD. Microdosing and other supposed neurocognitive enhancers are now ubiquitous across popular culture. Additionally, some of the most powerful psychedelic analogs are still legal in many states and abroad. Since 1997, the sacramental use of peyote is legally protected under the Free Exercise of Religion Act as an interpretation of the First Amendment of the Constitution, the amendment that Congress make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting its free exercise. And this law has been widely construed such that ayahuasca practitioners have often been able to conduct ceremonies under the radar, so long as they are associated with a recognized religious identity such as the Santo Daime Church and others. 
For those interested in expanding your library in psychedelic studies, let's look at just the covers of a few classic and recent works. Despite its discrediting Carlos Castaneda's The Teachings of Don Juan, A Yaqui Way of Knowledge, and other books in the series, are still widely read and influential in the periphery. Tom Wolfe's The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test is still worth a read, although more scholarly versions of the story have appeared later. I haven't had a chance to read Ernest Junger's Approaches yet, but I look forward to it. A recent study of Foucault in California, a true story wherein the great French philosopher drops acid in the valley of death, charts the effects of LSD on Foucault's life and thought. A somewhat more pessimistic account of the value of psychoactive compounds for philosophy can be found on various pages in Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus. And Deleuze also engages fairly extensively and quite positively with Castaneda's work, which is a shocker for some. Overall, the best three books on psychedelics and psychoactive substances I've read include Dale Pendel's three-part Pharmaco series, which is fully interdisciplinary and probably unsurpassable psychedelic odyssey of the late 20th century, Jonathan Ott's Pharmacotheon, Entheogenic Drugs, Their Plants and History is very impressive indeed. Quite recently, Graham St. John has published Mystery School in Hyperspace, A Cultural History of DMT, really a mind-expanding book and excellent in its scholarship on all things DMT. A biography of Terence McKenna by Graham St. John is due to come out pretty soon as well, I believe. Speaking of Terence McKenna's book, The Psychedelic Guru of the 1990s, they're still well worth reading. But I've always found him to be a bit of a better speaker in his live recordings than in his written work. That guy really kissed the Blarney Stone. Stanislav Grof has done a lot of work on psychedelics within transpersonal psychology. Alan Watts's The Joyous Cosmology is still a worthwhile manifesto. Timothy Leary's The Psychedelic Experience, a manual based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead, is still very valuable. It's interesting that Straussman, after publishing DMT, The Spirit Molecule, on his clinical trials on DMT at UNM, went on to write A New Science of Spiritual Revelation in the Hebrew Bible. James Orock, who unfortunately passed recently, is well known for having written the first book on 5-MeO-DMT. Schultz, Hoffman, and Ratch collaborated on the excellent coffee table book, The Plants of the Gods. Hoffman's LSD My Problem Child is also a great read, as is Paul Devereux's The Long Trip, A Prehistory of Psychedelia, and Daniel Pinchbeck's Breaking Open the Head, A Psychedelic Journey to the Heart of Contemporary Shamanism. And the list of fascinating books goes on and on and on. All good reads. I especially enjoyed Darwin's Pharmacy by Richard M. Doyle, one of the only book linking up psychedelic studies with evolutionary theory, and Scott J. Hill's reckoning with Jungian depth psychology and the psychedelic experience, and why Jung himself tended to reject psychedelics. Quite a while ago now, there's even been written a phenomenology of the ayahuasca experience, numerous books about the use of psychedelics in ancient Greek and Hindu culture, Psychedelic Religious Studies is still an expanding field, and Alexander Shulgin and Anne Shulgin were a chemist couple who literally synthesized hundreds of new psychoactive compounds. A story you can read about in their two-volume, Pical Tikal, A Chemical Love Story. I'd be interested in hearing from my students if you've read any of these so far, any thoughts you have, other recommendations or criticisms, and also about if you have any reservations about studying psychedelics. If you're watching this before class, do you want to maybe think about a psychedelic experience you had and what it meant to you? I'm also curious about your thoughts on cognitive liberty, legalization and regulation, whether and how it should take place, and what you make of the potential of psychedelics to treat PTSD, depression, anxiety, or for end-of-life therapy. Any thoughts so far on why or why not psychedelics may be relevant to philosophy and the study of existentialism and phenomenology in particular? On this last note, it's kind of shocking and extremely surprising that we can count recent works on psychedelics in the field of philosophy on one hand. For philosophy of psychedelics, this is pretty much it. Psychology, anthropology, religious studies, and New Age shamanism have pretty much dominated the field. We'll be talking about these works a bit later in the lecture. There is every likelihood that the legal and illegal use of psychedelics and other psychoactive agents in the medical profession, as well as for personal exploratory and recreational use, will continue to increase. This is why I believe students today need guidance on the historical moment we find ourselves in, its promises and perils, and how philosophy might help us to better understand and situate the history of psychedelia, what psychedelics reveal, 
and the possible meanings of individual psychedelic experiences. A few disclaimers before we proceed. This unit is not intended to encourage students to legal or illegal use of psychedelics or other mind-altering substances. It is intended to educate students on the cultural histories of psychedelia, the history of the psychedelic influence on philosophy, and whether or not psychedelics can be relevant for philosophy today. Two, due to legal reasons, no course credit will be given for student work that involves taking psychedelics or other mind-altering substances. This means no references to personal use in any coursework associated with this unit and no trip reports. They will not be graded. Three, that it's no secret that I'm a firm believer in cognitive liberty, the freedom of the individual to control their own mental processes, cognition, and consciousness, and also a supporter of decriminalization and regulation of all drugs. And I also believe strongly in academic freedom the freedom to research and publish without undue adverse repercussions. I believe individuals will make their own choices about whether exploring psychedelics is right for them. That being said, I strongly discourage anyone with a history of mental illness from experimentation with psychedelics without consulting various mental health professionals. Although the majority of psychedelic trips conducted after adequate preparation and study in the right set and setting go well and can be life-changing experiences, bad trips do happen and can be life-shattering experiences. Do not approach psychedelics lightly. Okay, so that concluding our general introduction, brief survey of psychedelic studies, let's look more closely into the question of what psychedelics have to do with philosophy. As we've seen, psychology, anthropology, religious studies, cultural studies, new age shamanism, Visionary art, and more recently, neuroscience, have pretty much dominated the field. This is unfortunate, inasmuch as it was philosophical authors such as De Quincey, Davy, James, Nietzsche, Benjamin, as well as philosophically inclined literary authors such as Artaud or Michaud, who first brought psychoactive substances to public prominence as important tools in the search for and philosophical study of religious and mystical experiences. There is also a discernible line of influence of psychedelic experience on modern philosophy and ancient philosophy, as we'll see. If psychedelic experiences do, on occasion, reveal important truths or phenomenological dimensions of human existence, nature, and reality, or tend to confirm or disconfirm speculative theories which are relevant to philosophical subdisciplines, such as metaphysics, epistemology, aesthetics, ethics, etc., then we might expect philosophers to take a more active interest in them. The reason why this has not occurred pretty much comes down to cultural and legal stigma. Luckily, I am an adjunct professor with a specialization in continental philosophy at a state university. You can be pretty sure that if I were a tenure-track or tenured analytic philosophy professor, by publishing this lecture I'd become a persona non gratis. But where to start in investigating this question of the intersection of philosophy and psychedelia? Well, of course, there's really only one starting point here, Aldous Huxley's The Doors of Perception, first published in 1956. Aldous Huxley was a prolific British author and philosopher, privileged by an Oxford literary education, the grandson of the naturalist Thomas H. Huxley, sometimes called Darwin's Bulldog, he settled in Los Angeles in 1937 until his death. He was a pacifist, a philosophical mystic, and a perennial universalist. Most famous as the author of the dystopian novel Brave New World in 1932, Huxley's most culturally influential work is undoubtedly The Doors of Perception and Heaven and Hell. In his last novel, Island, seldom read, Huxley places the visionary and sacramental use of what he now calls not Soma, but Moksha, from Sanskrit meaning liberation, at the center of a true utopia. According to some, Huxley remains today the greatest theorist of psychedelic aesthetics and its political theology. We'll be looking into Roger Green's reading of Huxley in a moment. His philosophical magnum opus, The Perennial Philosophy, is still worth reading today. And what's important for us in an existentialism class is that Huxley's experiments with and writing about psychedelics all occurred as the intellectual trend known as existentialism reached its zenith and at the same time dissolved and transformed into something other, i.e. the social movements of the 1960s. Existentialism didn't really die, but it transformed somewhat into the academic field of continental philosophy more broadly. 
Meanwhile, some of the deepest questions about philosophy of existence were no longer being answered in philosophy departments, either from an analytic or continental perspective. Rather, a key piece of the puzzle went underground, and psychedelic studies were born, mostly as a non-academic field, spurred on by individual researchers and explorers of consciousness. By the end of the lecture, we'll be trying to bring psychedelic studies back into philosophy. But before we do, let's look at his original articulation of the field of philosophical psychedelia. It was the Canadian psychiatrist Humphrey Osmond who coined the term psychedelic while brainstorming in letters with Huxley. Huxley writes, Dear Humphrey, could you call these drugs psychophans or phanero-psychic drugs? Or what about phanerothymes? Thumos means soul in its primary usage and is the equivalent of the Latin animus. The word is euphonious and easy to pronounce. Besides, it has relatives in the jargon of psychology. On the whole, I think this is better than psychophan or phanero-psychic. Huxley even gives a rhyme. Phanerothyme, substantive. Phanerothymic, adjective. To make this trivial world sublime, take a half a gram of phanerothyme. This was too esoteric and psychedelic was settled on at Osmond's suggestion. Now it's important to note that Huxley goes into his first psychedelic experiment with an already worked out metaphysical framework. In a letter from 1953, attempting to obtain mescaline from Osmond, Huxley writes, quote, It looks as though the most satisfactory working hypothesis about the human mind must follow to some extent the Bergsonian model, in which the brain and its associated normal self acts as a utilitarian device for limiting and making selections from the enormous possible world of consciousness. The basic problem of education is how to make the best of both worlds, the world of biological utility and common sense, and the world of unlimited experience underlying. I suspect that the complete solution to the problem can only come to those who have learned to establish themselves in the third and ultimate world of the spirit, the world which subtends and interpenetrates both of the other worlds. Green is right to note that this gives us a glimpse into Huxley's metaphysics. According to this metaphysics, human consciousness is limited and finite, but it can, on occasion, glimpse an unlimited and infinite consciousness, the second world, in Huxley's letter. The third, or true world, would then be a unifying of the two, a synthesis of finite and infinite, inside and outside, an ultimate world of the spirit that fuses both. Huxley had indeed worked out the cosmology implied by this kind of spiritual metaphysics in the perennial philosophy. Accordingly, we can't say that Huxley went into his masculine experience with his mind as a blank slate or tabula rasa. The masculine experience tended to confirm and lend support to his perennialist metaphysics of integration as an establishment of human beings, finite realities, within the one infinite spiritual reality. Congruent with this perennialist metaphysics, Huxley deploys a Bergsonian model of consciousness as itself a filter or limiting tool in the presence of the infinite consciousness of what he calls mind at large. How to understand this mind at large? Loosely based, ultimately, in its origin in the Greek nous, the supermind, we could say, of being itself, or pure existence. Depending on whether or not we take Huxley's mystical metaphysics seriously, we might be tempted to call his masculine experience a species of confirmation bias. The oft-quoted epigraph that opens the doors comes from William Blake. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is infinite. Huxley begins the doors with a brief account of the history of peyote, venerated as though it were a deity in New World traditions. Early pharmacologists observed that it changes the quality of consciousness and that it's physiologically non-toxic. Some of the science Huxley deploys is very dated. For example, research on adenochrome, which he mentions, proved to be a dead end, except in some recent conspiracy theories and Huxley gives an unsubstantiated mention of adenochrome's mescaline-like effects. See the wiki. Soon enough, Huxley begins his trip report. Quote, Thus it came about, one bright May morning, I swallowed four-tenths of a gram of mescaline, dissolved in half a glass of water, and sat down to wait for the results. Huxley goes on to describe each human being as an island universe, as well as the conditions for empathy 
and travel to other worlds, ordinary and extraordinary, and the possible techniques for achieving this, such as hypnosis, meditation, or the appropriate drug. Quote, I might so change my ordinary mode of consciousness as to be able to know from the inside what the visionary, the medium, and even the mystic were talking about. From what I had read of the mescaline experience, I was convinced in advance that the drug would admit me, at least for a few hours, into the kind of inner world described by Blake and A.E. Note A.E. is a pseudonym for the Irish nationalist writer and painter George Russell. But what I had expected did not occur. I had expected to lie with my eyes shut, looking at visions of many colored geometries, of animated architectures, rich with gems and fabulously lovely, of landscapes with heroic figures, of symbolic dramas, trembling perpetually on the verge of ultimate revelation. But I had not reckoned, it was evident, with the idiosyncrasies of my mental makeup, the fact of my temperament, training, and habits. I am, and for as long as I can remember, I have always been a poor visualizer. Words, even the pregnant words of poets, do not evoke pictures in my mind. No hypnagogic visions greet me on the verge of sleep. When I recall something, the memory does not present itself to me as a vividly seen event or object. Now, as an accomplished novelist, Huxley is certainly exaggerating, but he's also describing a common desensualization or abstraction of the imagination among the hyper-educated. Here you see some examples from Irish painter George Russell of what Huxley expected but did not see. Some psychedelic trips are very much like this. And some examples from William Blake's visionary art. So what did happen to Huxley? Quote, the change that actually took place in that world was in no sense revolutionary. Half an hour after swallowing the drug, I became aware of a slow dance of golden lights. A little later, there were sumptuous red surfaces swelling and expanding from bright nodes of energy that vibrated with the continuously changing patterned life. At another time, the closing of my eyes revealed a complex of gray structures within which pale bluish spheres kept emerging into intense solidity and having emerged would slide noiselessly upwards out of sight. But at no time in this more geometrical world were there faces or forms of men or animals. I saw no landscapes, no enormous spaces, no magical growth and metamorphosis of buildings, nothing remotely like a drama or a parable. The other world to which Mescaline admitted me was not the world of visions. It existed out there and in what I could see with my eyes open. The great change was in the realm of objective fact. What had happened to my subjective universe was relatively unimportant. Then Huxley turns to the famous flower arrangements, a belly of Portugal rose, a large magenta and cream-colored carnation, and the bold heraldic blossom of an iris. I was not looking now at an unusual flower arrangement. I was seeing what Adam had seen on the morning of his creation, the miracle, moment by moment, of naked existence. We'll talk about the biblical language here in a moment. When asked whether his perception was agreeable, he simply replied, neither agreeable nor disagreeable, it just is. Huxley's next move is his first extended philosophical reflection in the doors. Quote, Istikite, the German word for isness. Wasn't that the word Meister Eckhart liked to use? Isness, the being of Platonic philosophy. Except that Plato seems to have made the enormous, the grotesque mistake of separating being from becoming and identifying it with the mathematical abstraction of the idea. This is unfair to Plato, but it does reflect the intellectual attitudes of the period in the British Academy to Plato's so-called theory of forms. Huxley goes on, still leaning into Plato. He could never, poor fellow, have seen a bunch of flowers shining with their own inner light and all but quivering under the pressure of the significance. Could never have perceived that what rose and iris and carnation so intensely signified was nothing more and nothing less than what they were, a transience that was yet eternal life, a perpetual perishing that was at the same time pure being a bundle of minute, unique particulars in which, by some unspeakable and yet self-evident paradox, was to be seen the divine source of all existence. We'll talk more about this somewhat grotesque misreading of Plato later, but in any case, 
Huxley's preliminary description of psychedelic phenomena is both mystical and platonic. When Plato speaks of his own initiation into the mysteries of Eleusis, he speaks very much in this vein. As Huxley continues to gaze at the flowers, he perceives living light and the equivalent of breathing, a breathing with no recurrent ebbs, but only a repeated flow from beauty to heightened beauty, from deeper to ever deeper meaning. Much like Plato's own description of the beatific vision, mystical and religious vocabulary come over and again to Huxley's mind. He speaks of grace, transfiguration, the Western beatific vision, the Hindu philosophy of being as Sat Jit Ananda, being awareness bliss, which seems closest for Huxley to the experience and which he claims to experience existentially rather than verbally or cognitively for the first time. The mystical vocabulary continues. What the flower arrangement is showing is Suzuki's the Dharma body of the Buddha, as well as mind, suchness, the void, the Godhead. His flowers recall the Buddhist teaching story about a garden hedge that is really a golden haired lion, if you look at it in the right way. Even the books in his library are transfigured, red books like rubies, emerald books, books bound in white jade, books of agate, of aquamarine, of yellow topaz, lapis lazuli books, whose color was so intense, so intrinsically meaningful, that they seemed to be on the point of leaving the shelves to thrust themselves more insistently on my attention. This lure of magical looking, almost akashic books is a frequent psychedelic experience, I can attest. The whole thing so far is a preliminary exercise in what we might in hindsight call psychedelic aesthetics. Huxley goes on to engage with the visual arts extensively for traces of what his psychedelic experience is showing. These parts of the doors indeed kick off the visionary art movement. Nearly all visionary artists since have studied Huxley's doors. On the effects of mescaline, on our perception, our projection of space and time, Huxley comments, space was still there, but it had lost its predominance. The mind was primarily concerned not with measures and locations, but with being and meaning. These sections could be extensively compared to Heidegger's phenomenology of Dasein's spatiality in terms of making space and deseverance in Division I of Being and Time. But I won't do that here. Regarding time on psychedelics, Huxley writes, and along with indifference to space, there was an even more complete indifference to time. There seems to be plenty of it, was all I would answer, when the investigator asked me to say what I felt about time. In Huxley's privileging of replete and meaningful space versus near lack of interest in time, I suspect an intuitional commitment on Huxley's part to his metaphysical notions of, of timelessness and eternity. The doctrine of presentism lurks in the background here, and we could just as easily analyze Huxley's replete and qualitative space as a phenomena of temporalization, time's spacing, and space's timing, as the Heidegger of contributions would say. For philosophical foundations, however, we find here rather Bergson's notion of duration, which Huxley implicitly alludes to in its contrast with clock time. Quote, I could, of course, have looked at my watch, but my watch, I knew, was in another universe. My actual experience had been, was still, of an indefinite duration, or alternatively, of a perpetual present made up of one continually changing apocalypse. This is the theme common in psychedelic experience of stopping the world or bringing time to a halt, one perpetual present, an infinitely dilating duration. Next, Huxley turns to the furniture around him. Not only do the items of furniture cease to become what Heidegger might call ready to hand useful things, submerged in a background context of involvements, they become instead pure present at hand phenomena, but transfigured. Quote, table, chair, and desk came together in a composition that was like something by Braque or Juan Gris, a still life recognizably related to the objective world, but rendered without depth, without any attempt at photographic realism. For Huxley here, the cubist's eye gives access to a sacramental vision of reality. The flowers and the furniture are not so different after all. Both reveal an inner light during the mescaline experience, both reveal isness. The separation of subject and object, self and not self, thinking ego and intentional content, break down in Huxley's description of the legs of his chair. Next, 
and the most sighted of all passages in the doors, Huxley pulls out his heavy artillery regarding what he takes to be the philosophical, that is, ontological, epistemic, and psychological underpinnings, even conditions of possibility for such modes of visionary seeing that he has been describing. Quote, reflecting on my experience, I find myself agreeing with the eminent Cambridge philosopher, Dr. C.D. Broad, that we would do well to consider much more seriously than we have hitherto been inclined to do the type of theory which Bergson put forward in connection with memory and sense perception. This is the same theory we saw in 1953 in the letter attempting to obtain mescaline from Osmond. Quote, the suggestion is that the function of the brain and nervous system and sense organs is in the main eliminative and not productive. Each person is at each moment capable of remembering all that has ever happened to him, of perceiving everything that is happening everywhere in the universe. The function of the brain and nervous system is to protect us from being overwhelmed and confused by this mass of largely useless and irrelevant knowledge, by shutting out most of what we should otherwise perceive or remember at any moment, and leaving only that very small and special selection which is likely to be practically useful. According to this theory, our subjective consciousness is the trickle that we erect in self-protection from what he calls mind at large. Each one of us is potentially mind at large, but in so far as we are animals, our business is at all costs to survive, to make biological survival possible. Mind at large has to be funneled through the reducing valve of the brain and the nervous system. What comes out at the other end is a measly trickle of the kind of consciousness that will help us stay alive on the surface of this particular planet. Huxley is referring here to Broad's 1949 essay, The Relevance of Psychical Research to Philosophy, where we read, Each person is at each moment potentially capable of remembering all that has ever happened to him and of perceiving everything that is happening everywhere in the universe. For Broad, this cosmic ground of memory may help to explain veridical instances of ESP, extrasensory perception, and Broad was impressed by such phenomena as president of the Society for Psychical Research. However, what for Broad was described as a speculative possibility becomes in Huxley a metaphysical postulate, making sense of how psychedelic mind expansion is possible and works. For Huxley, the finite human mind limits and filters an infinite mind, God, the divine intellect, noose. Under certain conditions, such as the ingestion of psychedelic substances, the filter or reducing valve malfunctions, revealing the underlying reality of mind at large, submerged in, grounding, and arising for finite consciousness. It's a bit of a dizzying speculative theory. We wouldn't be wrong to point out that mind at large here is functioning very much and substituting for the term God or the divine intellect. In a quite Nietzschean mode, although I doubt Huxley read much Nietzsche, Huxley goes on to articulate a philosophy of language within this mystical metaphysics according to which human languages are symbol systems that encode implicit philosophies, and through them we reinforce the reducing valve of consciousness, cutting ourselves off from mind at large and privileging instead our biologically functional normalized consciousness. For Huxley, we are beneficiaries and victims of our language, its history, reservoirs of experiences of other minds, and reifications via concepts, that is, turning things into concepts and vice versa. It bears noting that this is the usual wisdom on language coming out of much psychedelic literature. We read often in trip reports how the subject's own finite mind is blown by infinite mind as what is indescribable, ineffable, going beyond language, either some kind of unmediated pre-linguistic reality or various other dimensions of a global consciousness of being itself, where language inevitably fails. On the other hand, it could be that many lack resources to understand such mystical, psychedelic experiences as in themselves arising from more primordial horizons of language, of being and meaning, as Huxley himself emphasizes earlier. This would be Heidegger's two cents, since for him, language is the house of being. Huxley goes on, quote, that which in the language of religion is called the world is the universe of reduced awareness, expressed and as it were petrified by language. The various other worlds with which human beings erratically make contact are so many elements in the totality of the awareness belonging to mind at large. At this point, Huxley is very much focusing on the utilitarian, communicative or instrumental view of language, 
but later in the text he'll make an exception for poetic language. For Huxley, spiritual exercises, meditation, hypnosis, and drugs provide various means not for obliterating the reducing valve of consciousness, but rather interfering with it. His picture of how this happens neurobiologically is vague and dated. Most likely mescaline does not reduce sugar intake to the brain. Importantly and usefully for us, Huxley focuses on four effects of mescaline on consciousness. One, mescaline does not impair ordinary cognition and memory, at least not in the way that alcohol does. I cannot discover that I was then any stupider than I am at ordinary times. Two, mescaline increases visual acuity, or what Kant would call the sensible intuition of sight. Huxley uses the term perception, and it does this because it interrupts the conceptual schematizations that the mind ordinarily and constantly perform in order to render experience intelligible. Huxley thus thinks that mescaline brings back the perceptual innocence of childhood or an oceanic experience. 3. Mescaline induces states of willless contemplation as opposed to willful activity. This role of mescaline as producing meditative thinking as opposed to calculative thinking and active states of the will will be explored later. Fourth, mescaline affects inner directed and outer directed consciousness successively and simultaneously. But overall, for Huxley at least, the impressions of the outer world are more heightened than those of the inner world. This is not always the case in mescaline experience or on other psychedelics, and it may be a peculiarity of this particular trip. Next, we get a key quote regarding the core of the psychedelic experience, revealing the quote, unconceptualized event. The key quote reads, summing up the ontology behind the doors, quote, other persons discover a world of visionary beauty. To others, again, is revealed the glory, the infinite value and meaningfulness of naked existence, of the given, unconceptualized event. Setting aside for the moment Huxley's metaphysical psychology of mind at large, and also setting aside the possibility of a bad trip, this quote is confirmed by countless trip reports. It may well be the phenomenological core of the psychedelic experience. But note how Huxley frames this unconceptualized event in the perennialist language of Euro-Christian mysticism, a beatific vision, a theology of glory, a gratuitous gift of grace, of infinite value and meaningfulness, naked existence, Adam in the garden but without shame, shame would be the bad trip, all profoundly Judeo-Christian motifs, suggestive of a theology of the divine event. On the other hand, the given, unconceptualized event could be read as suspending any and all pre-given thought paths or religious theologies. It also asks us to think everything anew in terms of the event, or what Heidegger would call erigeness. We've now covered very briefly and in outline the ontological core of the doors, and the next sections continue the meditation on psychedelic aesthetics. Along the way, we learn that the Homeric Greeks had fewer words for color. This is not proof, however, that they didn't see the same colors, but it is puzzling. We also learn that the Enlightenment philosopher John Locke was wrong to think that primary qualities those residing in the objects themselves, like mass or extension, are more real than secondary qualities residing only in the mind, like colors, smells, sounds. For mescaline takers, colors and all secondary qualities appear to be more real and substantial. This doesn't prove anything, but it is interesting. Next, Huxley returns to the legs of his bamboo chair, like the daffodils of Wordsworth, a bit pretentious, no. The next sections are humorous and seem to have been staged by Huxley and his trip sitters, ironically. After having come down a bit more sugar in his brain, Huxley visits the world's biggest drugstore. At the back of the store, he finds art books. By synchronicity, he opens one to a picture of Van Gogh's famous The Chair, providing some validation to Huxley's own perception of his chair an hour before. Such psychedelic visions to Huxley suggest that art, I suppose, is only for beginners. A psychedelic consciousness reveals just what great art does, which he calls the ersatz of suchness. Flipping through the art books, Botticelli's Birth of Venus fails to move him. Mars and Venus fares a bit better, but it is the windswept folds of the skirt of Judith with the head of Holofernes that stands out. Quote, My attention was arrested, and I gazed in fascination not at the pale neurotic heroine or her attendant, not at the victim's hairy head, 
or the vernal landscape in the background, but at the purplish silk of Judith's pleated bodice and long windblown skirts. This is really very humorous and reflects a kind of navel-gazing aesthete attitude that Huxley seems to have excelled in. Huxley realizes at this point that he has seen such textures of suchness before, that is, in the folds of his trousers. What a labyrinth of endlessly significant complexity, and the texture of the grey flannel, how rich, how deeply, mysteriously sumptuous. And here they were again, in Botticelli's pictures. A long digression follows on the depiction of folded textiles in art and the psychedelic aesthetics thereof. Inhuman and Baroque depictions of crumpled wool or linen are 90% of the human form in art, Huxley exclaims. And then, in a far too romanticized conception of the artist, we hear, what the rest of us see only under the influence of mescaline, the artist is congenitally equipped to see all the time. So we're going to skim this self-admittedly dandyish experience in the world's biggest drugstore. It's aesthetic imperative. This is how one ought to see, how things really are. In Kierkegaardian terms, we might call this the aesthetic stage of Huxley's trip report. But what of the ethical? What about human relations? Huxley asks. And his remarks are a bit disappointing. The psychedelic attunement to pure being is more accessible for Huxley during this trip in things and works of art, not human others. One ought to be able to see other human beings as still more infinitely important than the infinite in a pair of trousers, but this was not what Huxley experienced. Having become the not-self of things, eye contact with the selves of others had become distasteful to him. Quote, for relief, I turned back to the folds of my trousers. These are the sorts of things one ought to look at, things without pretensions, satisfied to be merely themselves, sufficient in their suchness, not acting apart, not trying, insanely to go it alone in isolation from the Dharma body, in Luciferian defiance of the grace of God. All very interesting, but at this point we can say the possibility of a psychedelic ethics is very much postponed. We'll skip also Huxley's take on Vermeer and Rembrandt and other painters of still life who he reads, again a little oddly to our ears, as unwitting painters of the Dharma body of Buddhism, and returns again for a second pass at a possible psychedelic ethics quote, but meanwhile my question remained unanswered. How is this cleansed perception to be reconciled with a proper concern with human relations, with the necessary chores and duties, to say nothing of charity and practical compassion. The age-old debate between the actives and the contemplatives was being renewed, renewed as far as I was concerned with an unprecedented poignancy. Mescaline opens up the way of Mary, the contemplation of a theology of glory, but shuts down the door on that of Martha, i.e. a theology of work or the cross. For Huxley here, psychedelics give access to mystic contemplation without the will to practical action. The visions they grant are not, however, strictly apolitical. They confront us apocalyptically with the abysmal gap between our vision and our conduct, our current state of self and society versus our potentialities and our ideals. Huxley's point here is that psychedelics cannot substitute for the hard work of ongoing right behavior and attentive mindfulness. Psychedelic experiences do not automatically make us better people. They might, however, open us up to other possibilities and new ways of existing and to the task of committing ourselves to certain standards of moral conduct and to certain ethical choices. Even world withdrawal and quietism for Huxley are choices not without ethical value. We could say that Huxley kicks off debates about the psychedelic ethics in a bit of an aesthetic and deflationary mode, quoting Pascal's remark that the sum of evil would be much diminished if men could only learn to sit quietly in their rooms. Nevertheless, for Huxley, psychedelics can operate as conduits for ethical transcendence. Quote, contemplatives are not likely to become gamblers or procurers or drunkards. They do not, as a rule, preach intolerance or make war do not find it necessary to rob, swindle, or grind the faces of the poor. And to these enormous negative virtues we may add another, which though hard to define is both positive and important, the Arhat, Theravada Buddhist wise man, and the quietist, or in Huxley's case pacifist, may not practice contemplation in its fullness, 
but if they practice it at all, they may bring back reports of another, a transcendent country of the mind. And if they practice it in the height, they will become conduits through which some beneficent influence can work out of that country into a world of darkened selves, chronically dying for lack of it. The ethical transcendence that psychedelics provide, although quite aesthetic and contemplative in Huxley, are thus related to our finitude and mortality, our being towards death. Due to time constraints, we also have to skip Huxley's section on the effects of music on the psychedelic experience, and the following sections reveal a rigorous philosophical structure. Having outlined his metaphysics, epistemology, ontology, and aesthetics in painting and music, of psychedelic experience, he goes on to discuss psychological, religious, sociological, indigenous contexts, theological, poetic, and educational implications. Great stuff, don't miss it. Critical responses to Huxley's doors of perception were on the whole divided. On the more negative side, the great German author also living in California at the time, Thomas Mann, writes upon receiving the book in the later 1950s from a friend, quote, Thank you very much for the doors of perception. Though the book does not excite me with the enthusiasm which it has you, it presents the latest, and I might add, most audacious form of Huxley's escapism, which I could never appreciate in this author. Mysticism as a means to that escapism, he's referring to the earlier, the perennial philosophy, was nonetheless reasonably honorable. But that he has now arrived at drugs, I find rather scandalous. The existential theologian Martin Buber, most famous for his I and Thou distinction and Hasidic tales, attacked the notion that mescaline allowed a person to participate in common being. The drug merely conducts users into a strictly private sphere, he avers. Such prejudices against any and all drug use, let alone drug use in humanistic and philosophical inquiry, tends to foreclose any kind of adequate critical response. We have to acknowledge, at the very least, that the influence of the doors is vast, and that it is the first sustained philosophy of psychedelia. As Roger Green has recently pointed out in his Transatlantic Political Theology of Psychedelic Aesthetics, a chapter of which I've assigned as a secondary source on Huxley this week, quote, Huxley believed that people's minds must be opened, even if by artificial means. A decade before Marcuse published One Dimensional Man, Huxley was looking for ways out of one-dimensional society. In his own words, quote, In such a system of education, it may be that mescaline or some other chemical substance may play a part by making it possible for young people to taste and see what they have learned about at second hand or directly at a lower level of intensity in the writings of the religious or the works of the poets, painters or musicians or philosophers. For green, young people are situated to benefit from drug use here. They also benefit from aesthetic enhancement that helps them better understand art. Instead of refuting the escapism charge, commonly leveled against him, Huxley rather tends to embrace it, arguing we need viable paths out of the trap of modern subjectivity, as in his 1958 Saturday Evening Post article, Drugs That Shape Men's Minds, where he writes, correlated with this distaste, for the idolatrously worshipped self, there is in all of us a desire, sometimes latent, sometimes conscious and passionately expressed, to escape from the prison of our individuality, an urge to self-transcendence. It is to this urge that we owe mystical theology, spiritual exercises and yoga, to this too that we owe alcoholism and drug addiction. Huxley's emphasis on psychedelics is thus an early form of harm reduction saying yes to the need to escape, but attempting to minimize its harmful forms. As Green shows, Huxley's concerns rest on an evolutionary anthropology in which humans move towards spirit, as the realm into which an individual may situate him or herself to find a balance between subjectivity and objectivity, where objectivity includes both the physical world and the latent unconscious. This accounts for Huxley's interest both in physical science and the paranormal, and he was not alone in this interest. Indeed, we can note that Huxley's third realm of the spirit appears everywhere in mystical literatures, perhaps most influentially in Joaquim de Fiore's philosophy of history. As the wiki summarizes it, 
the age of the father, corresponding to the Old Testament, is characterized by the obedience of mankind to the rules of God. The age of the son, between the advent of Christ and 1260, represented by the New Testament, is when man becomes the son of God. The age of the Holy Spirit, which is impending, urges towards a contemplative utopia. The kingdom of the Holy Spirit is a new dispensation of universal love proceeding from the gospel of Christ but transcending its letter. Huxley's hopes for a future well-ordered utopian society, in part oriented by its psychedelic sacraments such as moksha or psilocybin, we can find in his final novel Island, and they continue in this basically defiorian tradition of utopian messianism. The vision of psychedelic consciousness that Huxley promotes is very much a religiously and mystically infused sacramental one. Interestingly, this was all being worked out well before the war on drugs and during a period when the American CIA was funding shockingly criminal, overt and covert psychedelic operations, its notorious MK Ultra program, which inadvertently kicked off the psychedelic 60s, more so than Leary, Kesey or anything else. Roger Green's remarks on MKUltra are particularly helpful in this respect. For Green, both Huxley and the agents of MKUltra were exploring the extent to which an individual's conscious use of drugs might influence and redraw notions of citizenship. Green goes on, it is in this respect, and no mere conspiracy theory, that much of the psychedelic movement was a planned social experiment, not just in behavior modification, but also in citizenship modification. Green rightly points out how the debates around the illegalization of psychedelics in the later 1960s centers on the question of citizenship in the liberal nation state. The demonization and criminalization of psychedelics becoming a core component of neoliberal economic policy. In contrast to this, Huxley's more positive political vision of a psychedelic society, of a psychedelically enhanced citizenry that might well emerge from state-sponsored therapeutic programs the social unconscious becoming manifest and leading, after a period of integration, to more aware and responsible forms of citizenship. Why would this be possible? Because, in the words of Girard quoted by Green, true consciousness expansion, that is education, yields a transcultural perspective from which to view one's usual roles and the society within which one enacts them. Instead of this occurring within official neoliberal capitalist paradigms, and in the wake of illegalization and demonization, Timothy Leary founds the IFIF, International Foundation for Internal Freedom, which eventually morphs within and beyond its transgressive forms into the more widely acceptable cognitive liberty movement. You can read more in the wiki here. Indeed, the most enduring and influential aspect of Huxley's doors of perception lies in the social philosophy it promotes, its idea of the psyche in psychedelic and future societies. As Green puts this, if the literal definition of psychedelic means to manifest the psyche, the early usage of the term may seem accurate on the surface, but it is philosophically convoluted in its assumptions about what the psyche is, assumptions rooted in European conceptions of subjectivity and selfhood in the European imaginary. Thus Green approaches Huxley with the tools of contemporary critical theory, but without invalidating either Huxley's mystical perennial philosophy or his political theology. The current psychedelic renaissance, reflected in the recent work of Maps and chronicled in Poland's bestseller, How to Change Your Mind, have demonstrated that many of Huxley's social suggestions for how to integrate psychedelics into society have proven to be well in advance of his time. Now the debates indeed center around the therapeutic value of psychedelics in the treatment of anxiety, depression, PTSD, addiction, and end-of-life therapy, all among Huxley's pioneering suggestions, and the research is quite conclusive. Psychedelics are proving to be far more effective treatments for a range of psychological maladies than the chemical conventions propagandized by Big Pharma. Many commentators on recent developments believe that it will not be long before we are legally and institutionally revising our entire societal approach to the dangers and promises of psychoactive compounds and their possible roles in the quote, good life. One of the biggest takeaways from The Doors is its claim that psychedelics somehow access mystical or sacralizing experience. As Green puts this beyond the state in the European imaginary, the psychedelic experience produces a communion with the divine lost in the modern era. 
that is after Nietzsche's proclamation of the death of God. Psychedelic studies indeed respond on a new plane of experience to what Max Weber had called disenchantment or Entzauberung, literally the demagicking of the world, in that psychedelic studies very often promise re-enchantment, a rediscovery of the divine. One dangerous pitfall here is that psychedelic philosophy may fail to critically revise its own pre-political and or apolitical enchantments, or fail to reckon with horrifying experiences, and that it might fall into a messianism of fantastic outcomes, as in the archaic revivalism of Terence McKenna. For Green, quote, articulations of Soma figured in Huxley's work as the sacredly violent unconscious and as Big Pharma, and Moksha figured as psychedelics' unknown liberatory potential, are where psychedelic aesthetics and political theology meet beyond the crass representations of a globalized free-for-all. Green believes, and I concur, that beyond trite dismissals of Huxley for his aestheticism, pacifism, or mysticism, we need to take Huxley more seriously as an advanced philosopher and political theologian, speaking to our postmodern problems. As Huxley summarizes the Moksha experience in Ireland in his Notes on What's What, quote, the more a man knows about individual objects, the more he knows about God. Translating Spinoza's language into our own, we can say, the more a man knows about himself in relation to every kind of experience, the greater his chance of suddenly, one fine morning, realizing who in fact he is. Uh, last points on Huxley, as he repeats twice in his closing arguments, quote, the urge to escape, the longing to transcend themselves, if only for a few moments, is, and has always been, one of the principal appetites of the soul. That humanity at large will ever be able to dispense with artificial paradises seems very unlikely. This universal, ever-present urge for self-transcendence is for Huxley not to be abolished by slamming the currently popular doors in the wall, like alcohol or tobacco. The only reasonable policy is to open other, better doors in the hopes of inducing men and women to exchange their old bad habits for new and less harmful ones. We'll return to whether or not this argument works at the end of the lecture. Huxley goes on, on a note of caution. I am not so foolish as to equate what happens under the influence of mescaline or of any other drug, prepared or in the future preparable, with the realization of the end and ultimate purpose of human life, enlightenment, the beatific vision. All I am suggesting is that mescaline experiences what Catholic theologians call a gratuitous grace, not necessary to salvation, but potentially helpful and to be accepted thankfully if made available. We can add that for the intellectually and or creatively inclined, such psychedelic gratuitous grace may offer a general theory and practice of heightened creativeness, as well as a renewal of experientialist philosophy and possibly new and more tenable theorizations than Huxley's, as we've seen in ontology, metaphysics, epistemology, aesthetics, ethics, and the philosophy of mind. Having examined this first articulation of psychedelic philosophy, Let's pivot now to more recent work in the emerging field of psychedelic phenomenology. And here only one figure really stands out. His name is Peter Soschet Hughes, a philosopher of mind and metaphysics who specializes in the thought of Whitehead, Nietzsche and Spinoza, and writes in fields pertaining to panpsychism and altered states of consciousness. He's a research fellow and lecturer at the University of Exeter, and you could go and take an MA module with him on psychedelics and philosophy, if you are so inclined. I'm not really sure where else that's even possible. Peter is the author of Numenotics, Modes of Sentience in 2015, and more recently, based on his PhD work, and far more trenchantly argued, Modes of Sentience. He's also the co-editor of Bloomsbury Philosophy and Psychedelics, the first edited volume on psychedelics and philosophy. Uh, he has a TED talk you can watch and a really well curated and produced YouTube channel on Tologistics. And he's the inspiration behind the Marvel superhero Karnak. I've assigned this week two chapters from each of his solo authored books, the introductory chapter from Numenotics and his chapter on Nietzsche, and two chapters from his more recent book, Modes of Sentience. I didn't really know who Karnak was before, not really being a Marvel Comics fan, but it's kind of funny, especially since he writes on the Nietzschean superhuman, that his neo-nihilist perspective uh, became the basis for a Marvel superhero. So in the preface to his first book, What is Numenotics, he explains this new coinage in the title. 
Pneumonautics comes from two Greek words, nous and nos, meaning mind and ship. Ernest Jünger, as many of you probably know, coined the term psychonaut to describe the psychedelic explorer, like astronaut. Immanuel Kant coined the term noumenon to denote unperceived and inaccessible reality, what we can never get to through the phenomenal schematizing and projecting of the mind. For Soschet, whereas the psychonaut explores the psyche, or soul, an exploration we can more readily associate with the disciplines of psychology or religious studies, the noumenot explores the mind or intellect and its consciousness, and is a kind of philosophical psychonaut. The subtitle of noumenotics is also interesting, Metaphysics, Metaethics, and Psychedelics. And it's unified by the idea promoted here that psychedelic phenomenology, or what Sosjid calls Psyfen, may help us to deconstruct dominant philosophical dogmas in metaphysics and ethics, such as materialism, physicalism, reductionism, dualism. Siphon, again psychedelic phenomenology, may also be able to make a positive contribution in that it could provide evidentiary support in psychedelic experience, well analyzed phenomenologically, for specific philosophical theories in metaphysics. Sosjed indeed argues across his work for the truth based in logical argument and siphon of the metaphysical theory known as panpsychism. Quote, that sentience in its various modes exists not only through complex physiology, but in fact in all forms of reality. We're not going to get too much into his arguments for panpsychism in this brief introduction, but they are certainly the core of his work and really worth engaging with in written form, if not on his YouTube channel. His biggest influence in promoting panpsychism, and to some extent, panentheism, is the British philosopher and teacher of Bertrand Russell, Alfred North Whitehead. Whitehead here offering an alternative approach, which unfortunately wasn't much pursued until recently, to the logical positivism that developed out of Wittgenstein and Carnap. Bertrand Russell is in fact closer to his mentor Whitehead on many points in Sosjet's account. So the big philosophical players for Sosjet are Whitehead and Spinoza, but also Schopenhauer, Bergson, and recent philosophers of mind, such as David Chalmers and Galen Strawson, who I think examined his PhD. As to the meta-ethical claims made across his writings, they appear to me more strictly Nietzschean. A Sosjet is a avowed nihilist, by which he means that moralities are nothing more than power structures, which are fortified and conditioned by a metaphysics of the will. Rather than being limited by Nietzschean moral perspectivism, however, Sosjet often augments his panpsychism with either pantheist, Spinozan, or panentheist, Whiteheadian components. Spinoza's pantheism, pantheism, the doctrine that all is God, teaches that God is nature. God and nature are the Janus faces of a neutral monistic reality undergoing infinite modes. We're not going to get too much into it here, but his work on Spinoza is really excellent. Post Spinoza, in German idealism, and in Whitehead, the doctrine of panentheism teaches that God is nature and more. What this more is, is open for debate. Ultimately, for Whitehead, it is a cosmic creativity beyond even God. Although he clearly has his preferences, Sosjed doesn't decide for himself or his reader uh, which metaphysical position is most tenable. He often leaves this open and questionable for the individual noumenot. His unusual synthesis of metaethical nihilism, panpsychism, and pantheism or panentheism is likably non dogmatic, and it is almost always based in solid arguments. His overall position is nuanced, complex, and evolving. Um, I expect great things from this philosopher in the years to come. But before we get ahead of ourselves here, we need to begin at the beginning and ask. What is psychedelic phenomenology? And what are Saifen's possible roles in the philosophy of mind, uh, his field, or in other fields as well? So let's get into that question. What is psychedelic phenomenology? Sosjed begins his project with a very provocative claim, quote, for philosophers of mind, phenomenologists of any school, and indeed for all those interested in consciousness, the psychedelic experience offers the supreme impression. Even more to the point, to deny philosophers of mind psychedelic substances is tantamount to denying instruments to musicians. If one is to study consciousness, one must involve its most wondrous manifestation, 
Alas, the academic discipline of philosophy has left a potentially bounteous field of inquiry virtually unharvested. But what if psychedelic phenomenology were important fuel for philosophy? After giving a description of his first come up on a very large dose of Liberty Caps psilocybin mushrooms, Sosjed situates his usage of the term phenomenology. One subcategory of philosophy of mind is phenomenology, which in the sense used here is the study of reality from the initial standpoint of consciousness, or what Immanuel Kant calls phenomena. The post-Kantian approach here is well encapsulated in a quote he makes from Einstein, quote, I did not grow up in the Kantian tradition, but came to understand the truly valuable, which is to be found in his doctrine, only quite late. It is contained in the sentence, the real is not given to us, but put to us by way of a riddle. For Sosjed, psychedelic experience, or Psyx for short, puts to us difficult riddles about reality. Perhaps phenomenological description of psychedelic experiences, the psi fen of psi x, could in turn inform arguments for broader accounts in metaphysics, like philosophy of language or evolution, etc. Now, this definition of phenomenology as a subbranch in the philosophy of mind is helpful and useful, but it doesn't really mention the schools of so called classical phenomenology, such as Husserl, Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, Levinas, etc., and the variety of offshoots that these have had in the human and the social sciences. From Brentano to phenomenology as defined in the philosophy of mind, the methods of phenomenology have in marginalized forms persisted throughout the 20th and 21st centuries, although the methods of phenomenology have yet to be widely applied by academic professionals to psychedelic experiences. Sosjed's philosophy of mind inflected approach is just one example of how this could go. A lot of the work here has yet to be done. Accordingly, one of Sosjed's first big questions is why Psyx and Siphon have tended to be excluded from philosophical discussion. And he answers that this is due in large measure to the epistemic dominance, until quite recently, of logical behaviorism, which he thinks is an absurd view. Logical behaviorism is, quote, the view that consciousness does not exist, at least not as anything that can be scientifically studied. Only what can be empirically verified, verificationism, on this epistemology derived from logical positivism, can be logically studied. And you still hear a lot of analytic philosophers talking this way today, when they say if something cannot be empirically verified, then it is of no value. So Sosjed believes that Psyx and a possible Psyphen reveal the absurdity of logical behaviorism and logical positivism more broadly. The psychedelic phenomenologist, often without any observable behaviors to speak of, traverses unimaginably vast and complex inner worlds. The widespread behaviorist and positivist dismissal of the study of consciousness as such, let alone psychedelic consciousness, is part and parcel of the dominance of mechanist and materialist, most often physicalist and reductionist, but he discusses all the different schools, explanations of mind and nature. However, whether or not there are always neurological correlates for our consciousness states, any claim that consciousness states are just physical brain states and nothing more inevitably comes up against what's called the hard problem of consciousness. So what is this hard problem of consciousness which Sosjed talks about so very often? Coined in this form by David Chalmers, as many philosophers like to joke, the hard problem of consciousness is just that, really hard, how to explain it. Sosjed's first pass at an explanation, and there are innumerable, some of them better, in his later work and public lectures, quote, This is the problem that no matter how well one understands the processes of the brain and the nervous system as a whole, one still will not thereby understand how physical movements cause, interact, or are identical to conscious states or qualia. That is how physiology causes or coincides with phenomenology. The wiki basically concurs here when it writes the hard problem of consciousness asks why and how humans have qualia or phenomenal experiences. This is in contrast to the easy problems, which are not really so easy, but comparatively so, of explaining the physical systems that give us and other animals the ability to discriminate, integrate information and so forth. 
Chalmers insists that even once we have solved all such problems about the brain and experience, the hard problem will still persist. It's the reason why you'll never know what it's like to be an octopus, or a bat, or any other person, for that matter. According to Sostjet, if the hard problem of consciousness is taken seriously, then as Bertrand Russell put it long ago, there will always remain a certain sphere, which will be outside physics. It is obvious that a man who can see knows things which a blind man cannot know, but a blind man can know the whole of physics. One practical consequence of the hard problem is that while we can, on the basis of much evidence, think that the mind is conditioned by the brain, this has never been proven. Strictly speaking, we cannot even prove that other people have minds, known in philosophy simply as the problem of other minds. What this implies for us here is that phenomenology, let's just take his definition, as the study of reality from the initial standpoint of consciousness, is an irreducible aspect not only of all human knowledge based in experience, but of all knowledge and science as such. But what if Siphon, with its highly unusual qualia, indeed tended to problematize, put into question, undermine or variously render implausible dominant cultural and social scientific epistemologies and ontologies. Of course, a first conservative line of defense would be simply to dismiss psychedelic phenomena as non-veridical, that is, as untruthful, merely drug-induced, dangerous malfunctionings of brain and mind, or most dogmatically, as mere hallucinations, psychedelic often just being called hallucinogens and the kind of knowledge they impart being considered mere delusions. At this point, Sosjed wonders whether consciousness exists independently of brains, whether the relationship of brain to consciousness is less like that of the factory to the product, and more like that of a radio receiver to the radio signal, and whether Bergson, in turn Huxley, may have been right to some extent in the claim that the brain filters consciousness or mind at large in accordance with its bodily requirements. This leads him to alternative explanatory views of consciousness, such as panpsychism. Before any of these arguments can be made full sense of, we should look at Sosjed's first sustained response in his second book to the veridicality objection in the chapter Psychedelic Experience, Revelation, Hallucination, or Otherwise. Epistemologically, at least, responding to the veridicality objection comes first for Saifen practitioners, not least because whenever we try to describe the reality of psychedelic experiences, what they disclose or correspond to or even just describe them phenomenologically, the predictable response we get from a skeptic is always, but those are only drug-induced hallucinations, therefore nothing real or significant. Sosjet asks, can psychedelic states reveal any objective reality, or are they always subjective? The question of the objective existence of the realities perceived in psychedelic states is the question of the veridicality of psychedelic phenomena, and hence the question of the possible value to metaphysics of psychedelic phenomenology. His next move is to point out how the rejection of psychedelically induced veridicality takes two main forms, theist and physicalist. Theistic thinkers tend to reject drug-induced mysticism as fake mysticism, quote, revealing no truth in comparison to the revelations of the ordained saints and established mystics. The physicalist, at the other extreme, rejects super or non-human phenomenal entities that are encountered in psychedelic states as non-revelatory hallucinations, that is, as merely subjective. Incidentally, these two main forms are very well exemplified in Underhill's classic study Mysticism for the Theist Objection or in Dawkins' The God Delusion for the Physicalist one. According to Sosjed, what the physicalist and theistic rejection of all psychedelic-induced veridicality share is, quote, the belief that the existence of a physical substance, the drug, and its neurological ramifications, the neural correlates of psychedelic consciousness, is a sufficient condition for explaining the psychedelic experience. The experience is then dismissed, either as sacrilegious and delusional, or as merely delusional. Certainly, it can have, in addition to the drug, no divine or metaphysical cause. It was all drug, 
We could add to Sosjed's analysis here that such views applied to any indigenous culture and their use of psychedelic substances would prove to be suspect by today's standards, if not intolerably Euro-supremacist. As symbolic anthropologist Edith Turner has pointed out, when we deny in principle all forms of veridicality to beliefs and practices of indigenous cultures, such as the actual existence of gods and spirits, whether encountered on psychedelics or otherwise, we are practicing a rather extreme, if unconscious, form of intellectual imperialism. For Sosjed, there is a position beyond these two extremes. There lies the possibility that certain experiences on psychedelics are veridical and others are non-veridical. Some revelations and others hallucinations. The question is how this veridicality could be determined. Now on this question of determining psychedelic veridicality, Sosjed reviews some of the going criteria in the philosophy of mind. An objectively veridical experience, beyond just claiming subjective veridicality, that is that it seems true to me without saying anything about its objectivity, requires 1. Physiologically perceptive processes, such as a functioning eye, 2. An external perceived object, such as a lamp. Both 1 and 2, subject and object, are necessary for an experience of the real. However, neither is sufficient. One without two would be a hallucination. I see something that's not really there in the external world. And two without one would not be an experience at all. Sosjed concludes that the criteria for determining an experience as hallucinatory does not come down to demonstrating that it has neural correlates. That an experience has neural correlates tells us nothing of its veridicality since vertical and non-vertical experiences would both be expected to have neural correlates. So what are the going criteria for determining veridicality? Philosophers of mind determine veridicality in terms of four main criteria, sensibility, shared objects of experience, coherence with other beliefs, and rationality. Of these four criteria, you don't need all four to determine an experience is veridical, and each of them could be a sufficient condition on certain interpretations. As to sensibility, that one or several of the five senses can perceive an external object is in itself not a necessary condition for veridicality given that mathematical theorems are veridical, although nonsensible. Regarding shared objects of experience, if I perceive an external object through the senses but others do not, I rightly question whether my experience is veridical. But in the case of objects of psychedelic experience, there are shared experiences of objects that don't really exist out there in the external world, in the vast trip report literatures. Now on the third criteria, objects of experience that do not cohere with existing belief networks are often dismissed as non-veridical. That is incredible, we say, or that is beyond belief. However, this is a very weak criteria for determining veridicality, as our beliefs, as we know, are very often wrong and in need of ongoing revision. Lastly, when we can make rational sense of an experience, we are more likely to consider it veridical. Hegel even creates a philosophy of this in his famous dictum, the real is rational, the rational is real. However, that the objects of experience are logically coherent and not contradictory at best shows veridicality to be possible, but not necessary. According to Sosjed, all these four criteria neither refute nor confirm the veridicality of all psychedelic experiences. We have first to determine here the experiential content of psychedelic consciousness. Only then can we subject these contents to the ever-evolving veridicality tests of modern epistemology and the philosophy of mind. On this level, the criterion of shared objects of experience and of coherence with other beliefs seems most promising for determining psychedelic veridicality or not. A lot of work still needs to be done here. At a basic level, and due to the hard problem of consciousness, most brands of materialist physicalism either don't or can't give adequate accounts of consciousness. On this note, psychedelic phenomenology might provide experiential evidence about the nature of consciousness. Of course, evidence that reductionistic strands of physicalism are quick to refute. To conclude very provisionally this discussion of psychedelic veridicality, we might decide to dismiss so-called effluvia experiences, as when Huxley closes his eyes and sees only cheap patterns, 
produced by his sterile but overactive imagination, as non-veridical. In contrast to these effluvia experiences, there are however also epiphanic or theophanic trips, that is, major episodic event complexes, induced in psychedelic consciousness that are often reliably shared in psychedelic experience, whether when observing the external world or on inward journeys. These are much more difficult to simply dismiss as non-veridical. Just a quick shout out here to the only other book out there so far on philosophy of psychedelics. If you think of yourself as a scientific sort or are interested in pursuing the veridicality problem and how to quell the emerging conflict of psychedelic studies and naturalism, you'll probably want to read Lethby. He sets out from the common naturalistic objection that despite reliably producing mystical experiences of cosmic consciousness, Huxley's mind at large, and despite by the early 2020s being an undeniable clinical success in the treatment of anxiety, depression, addiction, psychedelic research and therapy tend to develop and procure these psychological benefits by catering to the drug's powerful ability to induce false or implausible metaphysical beliefs. According to Lethby's meticulously argued 300-page study, this comforting delusion objection to psychedelic therapy ultimately fails. But this is not, I guess thankfully, for the committed materialist, because psychedelics give access to metaphysical truths. Rather, as the blurb informs, while exotic metaphysical ideas do sometimes come up, they are not on closer inspection the central driving change in psychedelic therapy. Psychedelics lead to lasting benefits by altering the sense of self and changing how people relate to their own minds and lives, not by changing their beliefs about the ultimate nature of reality. The upshot is that a traditional conception of psychedelics as agents of insight and spirituality can be reconciled with naturalism, the philosophical position that the natural world is all there is. Controlled psychedelic use can lead to genuine forms of knowledge gain and spiritual growth, even if no cosmic consciousness or divine transcendent reality exists. Now, not having read Lesby's book yet, it just arrived in the mail yesterday, I'll get back to you on this one. But this argument seems to be a socially responsible philosophical cop-out, uh, very much rooted in the Australian tradition of materialism. You can read Sosjet's very generous review in this link digression over, uh, let's ask next, what are some of the contents of psychedelic experience that could become the basis for a possible psychedelic phenomenology? And we'll divide this discussion into just three possible contents of psychedelic phenomenology. The spirit world, changes to time and space, and possible telepathic or clairvoyant experiences. So for starters, psychedelic experience, especially on LSD, psilocybin, DMT-related compounds, and mescaline, among others, reliably produce encounters and interactions with radically other, perceived to be non-human, sentient entities. How to define the being of these entities is one of the holy grails of psychedelic phenomenology, and it's still very much in dispute. Nobody really has the answers here. What we do know is that interaction with spirits, ghosts, Elves, dwarves, demons, gods, fairies, aliens, to use just the Western term, are reported. The names given to such entities vary widely based on cultural factors, but it remains a fact that believers and non-believers alike do encounter what appear to be non-human sentient beings. One could argue, and people very often do argue, that these come down to psychic projections of aspects of ourselves, usually explained in terms of Jungian archetypes. But this does not change the fact that such entities are encountered. Indeed, such entities appear to be very curious about us, to have extended conversations with us, and they are very often, although not always, benevolent. They can also be horrific and malevolent, fragments of an Empyrean hell, as Sosjet says, often experienced as a darkness sublime. I myself have encountered such entities on many experiences in my own trip, and I'm hoping that my bosses are not watching this part of the lecture, in case I appear crazy. Very briefly, at the age of 10, and although I was not raised in Christian traditions, I spontaneously encountered gnomes, a melting Christ, and celestial selkies on a beach in northern France. At 15, I spoke to a satanic dwarf through a hole in the wall on magic mushrooms, 
At 19 and 20, I encountered machinic angelic choirs in the clouds, which were very reminiscent of Ezekiel's visions and looked quite a bit like Hegel's spirit, as well as many traditional unusual entities such as salamanders, undines, gnomes, and especially sylphs. At 21, I had what is probably the most mega psychedelic experience of my whole life, uh, wherein I encountered, after much study, all of the Greek gods and goddesses, and a sphinx during the course of a muse initiation on magic mushrooms, in which I spoke in tongues for about 12 hours. At 23, I encountered the god Mescalito in Witchell Visionary Art Splendor in a precognitive dream, and this was prior to being woken up um, to ingest peyote in the desert. At 24, I encountered various Gnostic angels and demons, including Christ, Lucifer, and Ahriman, among countless other spirit beings such as griffins, immortal horses, and other animal spirits like cosmic turtles on a very large accidental dose of LSD at Burning Man. At 27, I encountered Mother Ayahuasca and other spirit beings associated with Ayahuasca through the Icaros of the shaman who was presiding. And skipping a lot here, at 38, I encountered the Greek god Iakos of the Mystery Cry on DMT in the course of a day visit to the archaeological site of Eleusis. And this alongside many encounters with elves and other denizens of the DMT realms. Having read much of the psychedelic literature, but far from all, I consider many of my experiences to be typical, but others were more exceptional, uh, detailed, and sustained. And I'll probably never be done attempting a phenomenology of all of them. Now moving on from the first content of psychedelic experience that could be a possible basis for phenomenology, the encounter with beings in the spirit world, let's talk about the distortions or transformations of the experience of space and time on psychedelics. As we saw in Huxley, spatial and temporal distortion, and even what appears to be experiences of time slowing down almost to a halt, the nook stand of eternity, and the rapid transformation of spatial qualia are all very common on psychedelics. Sostjed pursues the implication of Psyx and Psyphen for metaphysics here, wondering whether commonly reported experiences of timelessness could imply a limited mode of access on psychedelics, especially 5-MeO-DMT, to what Schopenhauer calls the eternal now, or Spinoza's eternity, accessible in intellectual intuition as the intellectual love of God or more simply, access to the oneness of all things, the various forms of henology from the ancient Greeks to the present. I really appreciate this linking up of psychedelic phenomenology with metaphysics, but I'm a bit skeptical about Sosjed's apparent return, sometimes with a lot of qualifiers, to a metaphysics of time versus eternity. This is probably because I did my PhD on Heidegger, who proposed in Being in Time, in some degree of argument with Bergson, that being is always temporal, and that human being or Dasein is time in the sense of ongoing discrete temporalizations, the three ecstasies of past, present, future, of the primordial temporality of being. A Heideggerian phenomenology of psychedelics, which is yet to be worked out in the literature, I'd love to do this in the future, would tend to apply what's known as hermeneutic phenomenology to the reported experiences of timelessness, such as time stopping into the now point of eternity and would probably reframe them as modifications of Dasein's temporality and spatiality. On this reading, psychedelic phenomenological Dasein temporalizes and spatializes, just like authentic Dasein in Division II of Being in Time, but it may do so in novel ways that are quite interesting to philosophers. What we do not get beyond, however, on this reading is space and time. I would also surmise that what at least some major philosophers in the tradition are doing is in and of itself psychedelic in the literal sense of mind expansion, but usually without the drugs. The speculative thinking of Schelling, Hegel, and Heidegger are all exercises in exploring consciousness or Dasein. Sosjed doesn't really engage with these thinkers very much and often sees their French inheritors as quite pretentious, but I wonder if there are resources here for doing psychedelic phenomenology of space and time which are yet untapped. If this is right, and many thinkers in the tradition, whether or not they ingested psychedelics, may be helpful in defining how psychedelic phenomenology should proceed, that is, methodologically, but without prescribing what it finds. The last commonly reported content of psychedelic experience, and probably the least plausible object of a psychedelic phenomenology, is telepathic or ESP experiences, which can include clairvoyance, telepathy, and ESP or extrasensory perception. 
it is sometimes speculated on the basis of such Psyx contents and the entitative type discussed above that psychedelics have a big role to play in formulating theories about the origin of religion and are crucial tools for the philosophy of religion. That much is true. While I have experienced phenomena of all three types, with and without psychedelics, arguing for the empirical veridicality of any such experience of, of telepathic or clairvoyant, that is, seeing clearly events that are not currently taking place in one's field of vision, is extremely difficult, and until quite recently akin to academic suicide. I haven't seen Soshed go too much into these contents of Psy X yet. The basis for a possible approach to these experiences is already outlined in his first book in the chapter of Psychedelics and Empiricism, in which he argues that psychedelic experience cannot be accounted for within the empiricism premises of Locke or Hume. Psy X are demonstrably not impressions of sensation or impressions of reflection, nor are they ideas. And these are the only three types of mental content that exist for the British empirical tradition. Sosjed wonders if we can say that psychedelic experience is a third type of impression, which incorporates yet fundamentally transcends the first two. He further explains this third type of impression in terms of the quote, creative power of the mind, the imaginal realm, beyond the impositions given by sense and normal human experience. So this discussion of the contents of psychedelic experience that could become the basis of a psychedelic phenomenology is very incomplete. But at this point, if you missed the lecture in person, we stopped a bit to field any questions or comments so far. Looking at the often reported contents of psychedelic experience of Psyx, for most of us, they seem extremely wild and we've only just scratched the surface. How about anyone in the class? Has anyone had extraordinary experiences of altered perceptual states and altered knowledge, whether drug-induced or not? Has anyone seen spirits and what were they? Perceptual distortions, odd experiences of space and time, examples of possible telepathy or clairvoyance. What is really weird here is that such experiences are often so well documented and it becomes quite difficult to completely deny their veridicality. Take the case of Kant's meeting with the mystic Emanuel Swedenborg, in which Swedenborg fell into a clairvoyant trance and described a fire that was raging in his hometown, a fire that he couldn't possibly have known about. He was relieved at one point when he declared the fire had stopped a few doors from his own home, and this proved to be the case, which was widely publicized at the time as a completely inexplicable and miraculous example of clairvoyance. More commonly than these more extreme examples that it would be very difficult to create a psychedelic phenomenology around. And as we saw in Huxley, psychedelics might just make the external and internal worlds more luminous, radiant, or apparently self-transforming, producing an inner sense of an altered state of knowing and perceiving. Certainly, if such experiences exist and are not merely hallucinations, that is, if the veridicality objection fails at any point, then philosophers have their work cut out for them in attempting to explain such experiences and to incorporate them into existing knowledge pathways. If psychedelic experience and possibly a future psychedelic phenomenology has the potential to transform our understanding of philosophy and its various sub-disciplines, then what accounts for the relative neglect of this field? Any other thoughts before we look at the history of the psychedelic influence on philosophy? This is the title of the last chapter of Sosjet I've assigned for this week. And lest we get the impression that psychedelics are new to philosophy, or that philosophy can very well get along without them and their influence, one of Sosjet's most accessible and sweeping chapters in Modes of Sentience outlines in brief the psychedelic influence on philosophy. Nowhere is the influence of psychedelics on philosophy more apparent than at philosophy's beginning in Plato and at its culmination in Nietzsche. The claim is not just that psychedelic chemicals, as in the psychedelic sacraments at Eleusis, and the pervasiveness of spiked Dionysian viticulture are relevant historical contexts for speaking about Plato's philosophy. The claim is also, and more importantly, quote, that Western philosophy was partially engendered by the intake of psychedelics. Whitehead is most famous for his statement that all of European philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. But does this imply, often unwittingly, that Western philosophy is also a series of footnotes to Plato's distinctive philosophical theorization of psychedelic experience? 
Sosjed's account here and in his public lectures is short and it could be more developed. You could spend your whole life studying Plato and psychedelics, as he mentions. It is widely known that Plato was an initiate in the Eleusinian mysteries, and it's also now widely accepted that the potion or kakayon drunk in honor of the goddess Demeter was powerfully psychedelic. We mentioned what might have been in it at the beginning of this lecture, probably lysergic acid and I would say also mushrooms and opium, maybe among other things. You can check out my lecture on Demeter and the Eleusinian mysteries in the classical mythology course for a lot more on this. So it has also been argued recently that Greek viticulture in honor of the god Dionysus was spiked. And you can read here Renella's Pharmacon, Plato, Drug Culture and Identity in Ancient Athens. As is by now well known, Plato, for all that he preferred the Apollonian elements of Greek culture, he often speaks as an enchanted Dionysian initiate especially in the Phaedo and the Phaedrus, where he describes his own epiphanic experiences in the mysteries as very much a basis upon which he develops his philosophy. That is his soteriology, eschatology, psychology, and ontology of forms. For anyone who reads these passages of Plato and has done psychedelics, the psychedelic influence on the origin of philosophy here and on Plato's metaphysics is readily apparent and well worth exploring. It could very well be that Plato had the psychedelic experience right, but that he developed the wrong theory. Lots more to say here, but I should probably save this for separate video to keep it brief, so let's move on. As to the psychedelic influence on modern philosophy, Sosjed skips over the more contested history of psychedelic use in Christianity and in Western esotericism, mysticism, hermeticism, and alchemy fields he sometimes promises to explore more in the future. And he skips over the Renaissance to the Enlightenment, picking up his brief history then with the psychedelic influence post-Kant. The British philosopher Thomas de Quincey, as we've said, best known as the author of Confessions of an Opium Eater, was also steeped in three philosophers above all, Plato, Kant and Schelling. And he might have believed that psychoactive chemicals such as opium open up noumenal realities. But he never really says so explicitly. In any case, opium visions provided De Quincey with experiences of near total recall, platonic anamnesis, at least of early childhood events. Arthur Schopenhauer may have influenced Nietzsche's drug experiments when he wrote, quote, By wine or opium, we can intensify and considerably heighten our mental powers, but as soon as the right measure of stimulus is succeeded, the effect will be the exact opposite. The 19th century indeed had little clue about the existence of classical psychedelics which in larger doses tend rather to increase their effects, usually without dulling the mind. Now we don't have time to engage with the rest of Sosjet's second book, and we'll return briefly to the second assigned chapter in his first book, which is about Nietzsche and psychedelics. Any summary of the psychedelic influence on the history of philosophy would certainly need to acknowledge the daring and basically correct claim that, quote, if ever the term drug fiend were applied to a true philosopher, Nietzsche would fit the case. Despite Nietzsche's known rejection of alcohol, the accounts of his friend Paul Doyson reveal that the young Nietzsche did engage in heavy drinking, and his libation prayers to all the diamonds of history are recorded in his early letters. His later letters, claiming to be all the names of history, could even be interpreted as referring back to these early spiritual experiences. As early as the late 1860s, that is, after contracting dysentery, diphtheria, and possibly syphilis as a medical orderly in the Franco-Prussian War, Nietzsche is known by his biographers to have taken morphine and opium, often in dangerous doses and other drugs for the pain. Sosjed demonstrates, as far as it's possible to demonstrate here based on scanty evidence, that these early drug experiences directly informed Nietzsche's placing of intoxicated Dionysian consciousness and drug use, the famous narcotic brew, back on the philological and philosophical map in his first book of 1872, The Birth of Tragedy. Nietzsche added to his regular use of opium, chloral hydrate, not a psychedelic, but it does have known hallucinogenic effects, especially in the come down, potassium bromide, an anticonvulsive sedative, and a mysterious Javanese narcotic tincture which Sosjet helpfully speculates was probably a cocaine infusion with various other herbal, possibly psychoactive properties, can probably assume that he mixed all three together. By the later years, Nietzsche even used his academic credentials to pose as a doctor, self-prescribing whatever he wanted from the available pharmacopoeia of his era. The case of Nietzsche and psychedelics is certainly nothing to aspire to. In fact, it's quite tragic. As claimed by his mother and sister, it may have been the excessive drug use that led to the softening of his brain. 
The drugs Nietzsche had access to were all very physiologically destructive. If he had had access to today's less harmful pharmacopoeia, a lot might have turned out differently for him and for us. My own view is that Nietzsche's drug use, even of harmful drugs, was not what was primarily responsible for his mental degeneration, nor was it the never proven syphilis. Recent work has tended to make a congenital brain disorder and resulting brain cancer the most plausible theory of his mental collapse and subsequent vegetative state under his sister's care for 10 horrible years. But the drugs, and or syphilis, if it's true, couldn't have helped. Whatever the cause, Sosjed is right when he underlines that drug use inspired Nietzsche's philosophy and his philosophy inspired drug use. Indeed, Nietzsche's most consistent self-definition as a philosopher, from the earliest writings to the latest, is as an inspired rediscoverer of the Dionysian, the greatest and perhaps the last disciple of the god Dionysus, an incarnate Dionysus philosophos. And I've often thought that he wrote his Dionysian dithrams, which you can purchase translated by Hollingdale, while he was on drugs. Indeed, it seems quite likely that many of the most inspiring passages in Nietzsche such as his famous mystical account of the experience of inspiration itself, would have been inconceivable, at least in the form he gave them, without the drugs. Sosjed concludes on Nietzsche's drug use, quote, Whatever the future yields, Nietzsche's philosophy will be a significant factor thereof. His philosophy has already, a century on, had a decisive impact on history. That this philosophy was provoked in a degree hitherto undiagnosed by reveries occasioned by chemical measures exposes one to the realization of the great power of these substances, powers guiding history. Nietzsche risked himself, his sanity, his life, so as to touch the heavens and taste the Hades of human mentality. He may thereby have destroyed himself, but destruction is a joy to Dionysus, a deity who shall be born again. Note, the meta-ethical nihilistic hero worship implied here isn't much walked back in his second book, Modes of Sentience. Through his documented chemical self-initiations, there we read that Nietzsche came to hear Dionysus, signing off letters by the god's name. Nietzsche's drugs may have made him into the god that returned to supersede Christ. This seems crazy, and it is crazy, but on another level, it's not surprising. And many respectable people, in fact, take these parts of Nietzsche quite seriously. Indeed, the very respectable, if a little zany religious studies scholar, Jeffrey Kripal, after a lifetime of harboring the usual prejudices against Nietzsche, characteristic of the discipline of religious studies, recently had a conversion experience of sorts and came to similar conclusions as Sosjet here. Definitely the most influential hero in Sosjet's brief history is the American pragmatist William James. James did the most in the early 20th century to explore the potential of psychedelic consciousness for the philosophy of mind and metaphysics. And his work was also most influential via Bergson and Whitehead, who didn't conduct the experiment himself on Huxley's Doors of Perception, since it's formulated against the backdrop of these philosophical traditions. The little red American nitrous philosopher, Benjamin Paul Blood, also wrote a very short book entitled The Anesthetic Revelation and the Gist of Philosophy around this time. The pages on his nitrous experience are really short and at the end, but I suppose they put a transfiguring light on his complex readings of Fichte, Schelling, and pre-Socratic philosophers. It's still actually worth reading. Summing up the implications of his study of mystical experience, including psychedelic experience, James writes, The drift of all evidence we have seems to sweep us very strongly towards the belief in some form of superhuman life, with which we may, unknown to ourselves, be co-conscious. Jeffrey Kripal has written recently a bit more extensively on James in his book, The Superhumanities. James was indeed something of a pragmatist, no denying that. But he also wrote explicitly of the thick and the thin, and he decidedly aligned himself with the former supernormal, spook-haunted realm, no matter how disreputable or unpragmatic it got. On James's nitrous experience, finally, Hegel made sense. Now James could see the strengths and the weaknesses of the Hegelian system. Until, that is, the gas wore off. Can you imagine what the humanities might become if we tried that today? Think about German idealism after we take psilocybin. As a society, we have literally criminalized such altered states of consciousness. We have not cultivated them towards greater philosophical understanding. But this is exactly what James was doing. It is seldom observed, much less admitted, but William James was a clear precursor of the use of psychedelic substances to catalyze altered states and think about the nature of consciousness.
Sosjed's brief history goes on to cover, very briefly, so much more work to be done here, the experiments with and writings on psychoactive substances by Walter Benjamin, Ernest Junger, Octavio Paz, Herbert Marcuse, Jean-Paul Sartre, and Michel Foucault. And these are all, of course, highly relevant figures for a course like ours, with the title Existentialism. Could we really do a course on the philosophy of being and existence without looking at psychedelics? In a way, we could even say that Sartre's 1935 injection of mescaline partly propelled his rise to fame, resulting in his psychology of imagination and the psychedelically informed passages in his breakthrough novel, Nausea. In other words, as Peter sometimes says, we may never have heard of Sartre or his newfangled philosophy, existentialism, if it wasn't for psychedelic experience. All this came at a cost, however, as Sartre had one of the most horrifically bad trips of all time, and was haunted with flashbacks of being chased around by lobsters for weeks afterwards. Particularly noteworthy here for psychedelic ethics, although an unlikely source for ethics, is Ernest Junger's take on psychedelics as a taste of death, which was arrived at in dialogue and LSD experimentation with LSD's discoverer, Albert Hoffman, and Hoffman devotes a whole chapter to Junger in his retrospective, LSD My Problem Child. This moment is noteworthy for psychedelic philosophy because it is the argument that psychedelics confer spiritual and or psychological benefits for the terminally ill that has led to legalization for end-of-life therapy in many states, and you can read that whole story in Poland's recent bestseller. So beginning to wind up this lecture, let's ask really briefly if psychedelic phenomenology is even possible. Here, such just concludes his brief history by pointing out, a bit disappointingly, that the multifaceted, anomalous, alien, awe-inspiring, and at times terrifying nature of Psyx, in fact, often transgresses the phenomenological criteria by which analysis can take place. The resistance of Psyx to Psyfen analysis, we might say, is due to their novelty, or transience. Nevertheless, Siphon might yet provide a, quote, augmentation of the phenomenological toolkit, rather than as a mere mysterious anomaly to be treated with philosophic disregard. He concludes with one of his favorite quotes from A.N. Whitehead, who urged, the, quote, essence of great experience is penetration into the unknown, the unexperienced. If you like to phrase it so, philosophy is mystical, for mysticism is direct insight into the depths as yet unspoken. But the purpose of philosophy is to rationalize mysticism, not by explaining it away, but by the introduction of novel verbal characterizations, we could say phenomenological descriptions, that are rationally coordinated. This is where the art of doing philosophy and the art of having psychedelic experiences intersect in a possible futural psychedelic phenomenology. So the relevance of Psyx and Psyfen to philosophy, we should acknowledge, is only partly separable from the cultural study. Sociologically, psychedelic scholars should worry about the powerful and not always positive effects that psychedelic substances and other drugs can have on individuals and community, and on culture at large. On this note of caution, we worry rightly about drug culture in general. Are psychedelic users more likely to take a quick fix approach to existential and spiritual explorations, thereby becoming more vulnerable to the use of other, more destructive drugs as well, and in general falling into patterns of intoxicated inauthenticity and self-harm? These are really quite serious questions that are often not addressed adequately. Of course, BS speculations inspired by Psyx rather than a more rigorous Psyfen will be rampant alongside serious research and philosophy, so long as topics like consciousness, spirit, nature, and the divine remain mysterious. And they are likely to remain mysterious for a long time to come. Could well be that the finite understanding of human beings is too limited for us to ever unravel the fullness of the mysteries of being, life, cosmos, and universe. And it is here, acutely for many, that we still have a lot to learn from indigenous cultures beyond the intellectual imperialisms of our various reigning epistemes, or systems of knowledge. When you check out this very recent March 2nd, 2023 article, The Return of the Magicians, from the New York Times, you're led to wonder why many New Age and now transhumanist or digital AI accounts of Psyx tend to fall into the same traps we find in the New Age movement from the start. I want to be clear, I'm not dissing the New Age as a whole. There's lots of really well-grounded New Age thinkers, but there is a pervasive problem in New Age popular culture, an alarming emphasis on the power of positive thinking, manifest your reality, 
healing the environment and the soul of humanity through ritual prayers and magic spells, as well as entrepreneurial psychedelic white shamanisms and the entitlement fads of New Age goddess worship, etc. Magical thinking is surely a cultural problem we have, but that doesn't mean all magic isn't real, or that there aren't real magicians out there, psychedelic or otherwise, who are doing good work and maybe a small part of the positive changes we need. As to psychedelics, I tend to think that we get out what we put in, in a transfigured form. Neither contextualist dismissals of psychedelic experience as merely culturally conditioned and human projections, nor objectivist universalist accounts of psychedelic contents that psychedelics truly reveal are fully satisfactory. We will probably always be navigating this skula and charybdis. For example, if someone is indoctrinated into modern mechanism, transhumanism or AI messianism, things like Kurtzweil's The Singularity is Near Thinking, most of those people will come out of the DMT experience talking about beneficent or malevolent aliens who are destroying or saving our world or our culture, usually behind the scenes. Their worldview hasn't been changed by psychedelic ingestion, it's just been problematically empowered. And this is another very good reason why we need a philosophy of psychedelics approach. If any dimension of human experience calls out for clear and integral philosophical thinking, it is the flora and the fauna of Psy-X. Whether or not psychedelic phenomenology is really possible, and whether it's able to make a positive contribution to human knowledge, can only be answered in the future. To begin something of a provisional conclusion, I want to say that I really admire Sosched for his courageous and rigorous commitment to putting psychedelic phenomenology back on the map in the analytic-dominated fields of philosophy of mind and analytic metaphysics. His use of Spinozist and Whiteheadian being and knowing ontology and metaphysics arguments towards making more cogent and tenable previously ridiculed doctrines such as panpsychism or panentheism are very well stated, and they have also helped the general public make a lot more grounded sense of their psychedelic experiences than they might have otherwise. Instead of abandoning rationality, the psychonauts who read Sosched take interesting, if provisional, steps towards becoming possible noumenauts. Sosched's question for us is very much Bertrand Russell's question. Can we espouse and embrace mystical experience without displacing rationality? We don't yet know what directions the field of psychedelic phenomenology will take. Sosjet gives us one Spinozist whitehead version of what its future might look like. His knowledge sometimes does fall short, however, when he talks about non-Western, especially indigenous, philosophical approaches to psychedelic knowledge. At the close of his first chapter, Sosjet writes a scathing indictment, and I completely agree. That, for instance, a fungus shown to pose no danger to health in fact, conversely shown to have therapeutic properties, as well as having great academic import, that such a fungus that commonly grows in local pastures is prohibited by threat of severe punishment by many nations, even listed as a Schedule I drug by the United Nations, is an affront to human dignity and an affront to reason itself. It is certainly a restraint on the freedom to expand one's mind. We must alter the current impression of psychedelics and allow psychedelic phenomenology to once again enter the academic field of inquiry. In a future video, I'd like to work out an alternative approach to psychedelic phenomenology, drawing from fields I know a little better, such as Heidegger's later phenomenology of the holy and his being historical thinking of the first and the other beginnings, rethought as psychedelic inceptions, alongside Schelling's later philosophy of mythology especially his short text, The Deities of Samothrace, as well as recent religious studies and indigenous studies scholarship on altered states of knowledge. And I'd like to note in conclusion that while writing this lecture, I received a surprise invitation from an old Canadian friend to spend the spring break on peyote pilgrimage in the San Luis Desert with a wirikuta that is Huicho, Curandero and his family. Wish me luck. Uh, you can check out a great documentary about them on this link. And don't forget to check out and subscribe to Sosjed's amazing YouTube channel, Ontologistics. I'll conclude here with an interesting question for all of us who are thinking about maybe trying a classical psychedelic. Thanks for listening, everyone, and we'll see you in the next video. I'm, I'm considering like uh, uh, this 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 uh, psychedelic retreat myself, psilocybin. Oh, right. Yeah, um, I'm not really asking for permission, but I I do think I know the answer. W would you recommend Would you recommend it to me or? Um, I suppose you can put it like this. Um, 
The classic psychedelics are now, all the scientific evidence shows they're not harmful. Quite the contrary, they're quite beneficial. That's at least the current science. Um, so there's no, there's no physical fear to be had. But the potential of the betterment of the mind is huge. It will make you understand this really old problem, the mind matter or the mind body problem. It might even change your metaphysical views, you know, your sort of um, your political views, your religious views. There's no physical danger. There's a slight psychological danger. You can have um, very, some people, it has happened, you know, have um, frightful terror trips, like horrific nightmares. But even that's interesting, you know. Yeah. <laughs>